Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Iron Coffins Part 34. Before we begin, a quick word. There may be some rain noises in the background of this episode because the weather obviously doesn't care about my recording schedule. I apologize for any inconvenience. And now, on with the episode. It couldn't possibly have been the intention of High Command to destroy our boats by ramming. We had fought hard to preserve our lives and to get our boats through months of defeats and increasing losses to be ready for our greatest task. Now, with only a few of us left alive, leadership demanded the sacrifice of all survivors without giving another thought to how and with what the naval war should continue. Was suicide the ultimate purpose of our long training? Was this futile, worthless gesture the greatest glory, the greatest honor and satisfaction that we could take with us to the grave? I regained my composure and asked the bearer of the order. Sir, does your order mean that we should ram an enemy vessel even if we should have the opportunity to return to base and take on a new load of torpedoes? The order is to ram. That's exactly what leadership means, gentlemen. I must speak frankly. You will not have the opportunity to repeat your attack. Your final mission is fulfilled with your first attack. Admiral Dönitz demands total commitment even if it means deliberate self-destruction. That was very clear. Rösing's interpretation of the order from the Supreme Commander was indeed very precise and left us no choice but to carry out the German form of the Japanese kamikaze. Was this outrageous order perhaps a hidden concession by leadership that the war was already hopelessly lost? I dared not think further in that direction. An order is an order and I had to obey. Heinz Sieder, commander of a snorkel boat, allowed himself to interrupt the guest. Respectfully propose, sir, to send the snorkel boats into the channel now. It would be a great advantage for us to be in the operational area before the enemy strikes. We could intercept its landing fleet at sea and inflict severe losses on it before it has a chance to reach the mainland. We cannot afford to expose our boats to allied defenses before the invasion, our guest replied. Furthermore, we have no idea where its landing fleet will cross the channel. You will receive the order to sail soon enough. We have established a well-functioning alarm system along the coast. Instructions for the deployment of each boat will be given to you gentlemen at the decisive moment. That is, when you leave Brest. Do you have any more questions? You still have time to ask questions, gentlemen. What else was there to ask? We had been trained to execute orders without question. Everyone was lost in their own thoughts and wrestling with their conscience. The conference disbanded and each went their own way to suppress doubts and came to terms with their thoughts. I retreated to my room, turned on the radio, sank into the wide armchair and tried to think clearly. I anticipated that once the invasion began, our snorkel less boats would be sunk by the concentrated Allied sea and air reconnaissance before we could reach a certain point in the channel. Thus, only seven boats equipped with snorkels had a chance to reach the invasion area. Seven submarines. That was the maximum number the U-Boat Command could muster to face an invasion in the channel. And these seven boats would, if my experience with the Allied naval power were any measure, face an invasion fleet of thousands of freighters, warships of all kinds and landing craft not to mention the tens of thousands of airplanes that would darken the sky like a blanket over the sea. Of course, seven submarines could not stop such a gigantic armada. Even the assumption that they could inflict any significant losses on such a landing fleet was a childish illusion. If our armies and the air force were unable to repel the gigantic onslaught against our coastal defenses and drive the allies back to sea, then may God have mercy on our souls and Germany. The introduction of a six-hour readiness forbade any shore leave for our 15 doomed crews. Issued leave passes were revoked and I took special care of my men and tried to make them forget that their final hour was soon to come. Bus rides, marches and sports events kept the men active and in competition. We commanders spent many hours at the fleet's recreational area, Les Trechiers, we swam in the sea, basked in the sun, played chess or bridge with the girls from the naval administration who had no idea about our mission. We never spoke about a landing, but thought about it incessantly. Everything reminded us of death, especially the equipment that was supposed to preserve our lives. On weekdays we watched the boats equipped with snorkels training in the blue waters of Brest Bay. We non-snorkelers, both crews and officers, followed the maneuvers with increasing jealousy. We watched as the small snorkel heads cut through the surface, leaving only a short white foam trail behind. Then we, the neglected ones, knew that the snorkel allowed for life, while without it we would inevitably perish. On Sunday, May the 28th, the 15 commandos were invited by an SS division to the Channel Coast to gain an impression of the defense installation set up along their coastline. We were driven to the coast by truck, where we were shown the latest weapons, heavily armored bunkers, artillery and hundreds of vehicles. Some companies of the Waffen-SS demonstrated in impressive maneuvers how they would repel any invaders. 
The SS division consisted of very young people, most of them were not yet 18 and their officers were not much older. Yet their demonstration gave us renewed confidence that the Waffen-SS, the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe were capable of smashing a landing in its infancy and we returned to Brest somehow relieved. That night we counted seven incursions of individual aircraft into the airspace over the Bay of Brest. The next morning, May the 29th, the adjutant informed me that all boats were to remain at their moorings until further notice. He said, the Tommies have laid one of their mines in front of our bunker. A flag gunner stationed on the bunker's roof saw the mine drop and our minesweepers will quickly deal with the matter. The inner harbor should be reopened to traffic by nightfall. These Tommies, I said angrily, soon they'll be laying their eggs in our beds. The adjutant knew exactly what I meant. For the rest of the day, two minesweepers cruised the inner harbor basin, focusing their search on the entrance to the bunker where 15 boats were being held captive. Despite their greatest efforts, however, the two vessels were unable to find the mine. The search was called off in the evening and the harbor was reopened to traffic. The matter was closed. The gunner had surely been a victim of his own nervousness, which was reaching a boiling point in all of us. After consulting with the gunner, I was convinced by his account and ordered my officers to use only the quiet electric motors during maneuvers in the harbor basin. Days of tense waiting alternated with sleepless nights. The increasing air raids, the active French resistance movements, the growing aversion of the Breton population, the aggressive propaganda of the allied soldiers Radio Calais and the prospect of a full moon associated with a high tide, all these things pointed to the possibility of an imminent landing. And when, on June the 4th, a British squadron of four-engine liberators descended from the noonday sun onto our U-boat bunker to destroy our boats already in the harbor, I knew that the hour of our final deployment was very near. Then came June the 5th. In the early hours of the morning, before the chirping of birds ceased in the emerging heat of the day, I took my men, as usual, onto the country roads. We marched, singing through the suburbs into the countryside. The outing was welcomed by the crew as a welcome change from the daily routine, their songs echoed loudly from the walls of the old houses, awakening many a Frenchman who irritably closed their shutters. In the afternoon I left the men in the care of the duty officers and went to Brest with Heinz Sieder, the commander of U-984. At 6pm we called the base to make sure that the invasion had not begun without us. Since no alarming reports had come in, we decided to have dinner at one of our favorite restaurants instead of setting for the thin sandwiches served at the base. We entered the restaurant, ordered two large lobsters, had baked snails as an appetizer and enjoyed a Breton meal without thinking about our uncertain future. I missed the pretty girls of Brittany, who had become so shy and reserved lately, thought of Marguerite in Paris and regretted not being able to see her again. The base was in complete silence when we returned to the building complex. Everything was dark. The few lamps and lights were dimmed, the crews were sleeping in their quarters. Only the night watch and some men in the radio room were still awake. A pounding woke me up. Fist blows drummed against the door. Then I heard the excited voice of the steward. Alarm! Alarm! The Allies have landed! Alarm! Within a second I was at the door. Where have they landed? In Normandy! The invasion is in full swing! And off he rushed to wake my comrades. I turned on the light and looked at my wristwatch. It was 3.47 am. The date? June 6th, 1944. While the Allies had boarded their ships and landing craft, while they had warmed the engines of their fighter planes and bombers, while they had crept across the channel under cover of darkness to strike unexpectedly, we were asleep some 200 nautical miles from where we should have been at this hour. Tense, but strangely calm, I put on my submarine kit. There was little left for me to do. Methodically, I gathered my few belongings, bundled them up and stored them in the locker, tucked my toothbrush and a small tube of toothpaste into the breast pocket of my green blouse, threw my sheepskin jacket over my shoulders, pulled down the white cap, locked the room, bounded down the stairs, ran out of the building and down to the bunker. My moment had come. I knew I would not return. The crew was assembled on deck for the final roll call. I crossed the gangway and the first watch officer reported, all hands on board, boat is ready to sail. I touched the brim of my cap and addressed my men. Attention everyone, you all know that the enemy has landed or is about to land, so we are no longer in a position to prevent this. But what we can do is this, we can cut off their supplies and prevent them from transporting further war and human material across the channel. We will do our best. Prepare for immediate departure. All hands, battle stations. I saw no reason to tell them the whole deadly truth. As far as my men were concerned, the mission would unfold for them just like any other. They didn't know that leadership had already given up on them. I paced back and forth on the deck, awaiting the order to cast off. Alongside was U-629. Leutnant Books was just as nervous, pacing around. 
We had emptied a bottle of wine together in Le Trichier. Although we both knew that our final battle was just a few hours away, we managed to put on a smile and exchange good wishes. Then I resumed my steps on deck. The minutes ticked by. An hour passed without action. Then the decisive night slowly faded away. A new day dawned hesitantly over the coast of Normandy, where the greatest invasion of all time was underway. An immense fleet of over 4,000 landing craft with 30 divisions of Allied troops, 800 destroyers, cruisers, battleships, warships of all kinds, was about to reach the mainland coast, which had been bombarded by over 10,000 Anglo-American aircraft. Divisions of airborne troops rained down behind our coastal defenses. Countless gliders, laden with troops, equipment, tanks, guns and supplies of all kinds, landed in the Normandy meadows. As the French soil shook under the millions of exploding bombs and shells, as the first waves of attackers were decimated by the concentrated fire of the defenders, as only a few of our own aircraft found their way into the air, as the resistance of our soldiers, tanks and guns slowly collapsed under the massive onslaught from the air and sea, 15 submarines waited under the protective cover of the concrete bunker in Brest for the departure orders, while another 22 boats lay safely in other Biscay ports and 22 boats in Norwegian fjords. At 10 o'clock, still no departure order. Not a single word had reached us. Our men brought the shortwave receivers to the upper deck to listen to the ongoing reports from the front. Broadcasters flooded the realm with news of the landing, reporting on the heroic resistance of our armies and how they drove the invaders back into the sea. Fanfares blared, military marches resounded and a thousand words promised the nation that the battle would end with a victory for our arms. Confusion grew as orders were given and rescinded. The longer time passed, the greater the confusion became. At noon, the boats still lay idle in the bunker. Rumors and false alarms chased each other like bulls in a stampede. At 2.40 pm, we 15 commanders were asked to report to Winter's office. Oppressive silence prevailed as Winter handed each commander a sealed envelope. I opened the blue envelope and unfolded the red paper containing Dönitz's long-delayed final order. As I looked at the telegraph, the letters blurred together. With effort, I read. U-415, sail at midnight. Proceed at full speed above water towards the English coast. Operational area between Lizard Head and Heartland Point. Supply shipping is to be attacked and destroyed. Dönitz. This order was even more incomprehensible than the existing ramming order. The new instruction required me and my seven comrades, also without snorkels, to resurface and unprotectedly advance towards the south coast of England. At a time when the sky was black with aircraft and the sea was littered with destroyers, corvettes and other anti-submarine vessels. It was clear to me, we wouldn't live long enough to commit suicide by ramming. The seven snorkel-equipped boats were instructed to submerge into the landing area, but their slow underwater journey would only delay their destruction by a few days. Winter's face was pale and grim. He clasped the hands of the commanders who had become his friends. He had done everything in his power to ease our last days. Now there was nothing more to do. Madness prevailed. It was shortly after 5 pm when I returned to the bunker. The loudspeakers fell silent, the gigantic armored vault resounded with the songs of our 800 men who awaited the order to depart. They had no inkling that the voyage against the enemy would be a short journey to death. At 9.30 pm, as night slowly descended over the battlefields in Normandy, 15 submarines slipped from their moorings and one by one moved into the Bay of Brest. The watch was clear, the stars faintly illuminated the shimmering firmament. Soon the full moon would rise, guiding us with its light into the Atlantic. The seven snorkel-equipped boats set course for the Atlantic. Their conning towers disappeared beneath the black surface at intervals of 5 to 10 minutes. Their departure went unnoticed by the English machinery flying along the coast, ready to attack and destroy anything crawling on the water. As the boats, invisible and spaced at regular intervals, sailed through the narrow waterway into the open sea, we non-snorkelers lay in the dark bay next to the patrol boats, waiting for the large red ball of the full moon to rise closer to the earth. At 2.30 am, eight boats silently glided with the escort vessels toward the entrance of the bay. As we reached the deeper channel, our diesel engines began to hum. The black silhouettes of eight boats swung one after the other into the wake of the leading minesweeper. U-989 under Captain Lieutenant von Rotenberg took the lead of a long chain. U-413 with Dieter Sachse followed closely. Then Boddenberg brought his U-963 into the line. U-740 Stark followed, then came Books U-629, Knackfuß U-821. Behind them was U-415 with myself on the bridge. Brauer on U-256 brought up the rear. By now, the moon had risen above the horizon in the southeast. He stood like a giant lantern in the sky. His glow illuminated the long line of submarines and reflected in the calm sea. 
Contrary to habit, all my men had donned their life jackets. Piles of ammunition were stacked on the bridge, the tower was an arsenal. The gunners awaited the first enemy planes with bated breath and their 2cm cannons and 3.7cm automatic guns. The lookouts strained their eyes into the bright night. The radio operators listened with bated breath for the first detections and the stokers worked with racing pulses in the hot chambers of the steel tube. I stood on the starboard side of the bridge, trying to keep my boat in the wake of U-821 and at the agreed distance of 300 meters. 11.10pm The first chirping detections were picked up by our mosquito and fly, the latest warning devices, as the coast receded further. Six detections, all in the forward sector, increasing in volume quickly. The report from below alarmed every man on the bridge. All ears turned to the wind. All eyes focused on the sky ahead of us. I stepped onto the footrest and let my gaze penetrate the armored plates of the tower into the purplish darkness. But the bright moonlight still revealed none of the black monsters. 11.20 pm. The front of our procession reached the open sea. With escort vessels on parallel course, the eight boats plowed through the silvery surface and penetrated deeper into the enemy defense line. The screeching of loud detections and the stream of warnings from below mingled with the roar of the diesel engines and the whirring of the fans. 11.40 pm. Suddenly, fireworks erupted in the port bow sector about five miles ahead. I recalled a warning we had received before sailing that several of our destroyers from Lorient were en route to Brest and we should not mistake them for the British. I raised my powerful binoculars to my eyes and saw seven destroyers engaged in an air attack in a line abreast formation. Thousands of tracer rounds streaked through the night sky, dazzling flares descended upon our ships. Together with the yellow glow of the moon, they turned the night into day. The sound of anti-aircraft guns, countless cannons and the reverberations of roaring aircraft engines grew louder as we approached the scene of the battle. The Tommies, warned by our approach, suddenly ceased their wild attacks on the destroyers to avoid getting caught in the crossfire between submarines and destroyer cannons. The destroyers steamed shortly afterward in the opposite direction along our long line to the east. Recognizing their chance for a well-protected return to port, our escort vessels broke formation and followed the destroyer's wake. Their maneuver left our eight boats at the mercy of ruthless destruction from the air. At that moment, all boats acted on the command of their captains, and I called through the voice tube, Both engines full speed ahead. Shoot on sight. June 7th, 12.15 am. Our long chain surged at full speed towards the western exit of the channel. The diesel engines wheezed, their exhausts smoked, detections pursued us with increasing volume. Repeatedly, I glanced at the luminous dial of my wristwatch to count the minutes we still had above water until the first blow would strike us. 12.30 am. Detections chirped across the entire horizon. The volumes raged from faint lamentations to loud cries. The Tommies circled in staggered distance around our procession. They must have been convinced that we were no longer in control of our senses. Submarines acting senselessly had not yet been in their crosshairs. Occasionally, I heard the drone of aircraft engines nearby, but could not spot any machines. The hands of my wristwatch crawled slowly forward. These were the minutes when the Tommies planned their attack, awaited reinforcements and the bright moon rose higher in the sky. Minutes when our diesels roared and our boats relentlessly drove towards the enemy, sharpening our senses and quickening our hearts. 1.12 am. The battle began. Our lead boats were attacked. Flares scattered in different directions. Then the bark of cannon and gunfire reached our ears. Water fountains rose into the sky. 1.17 am. One of the planes was hit. It fell like a comet towards the leader of our group, flew over the boat, dropped four barrels and then plunged into the sea. A crash and the machine was gone. Four massive water spouts shot up and U-963 with Boddenberg was crippled. With a rudder jammed hard to port, the boat veered out of line, rapidly lost speed and sank. 1.25 am. The planes repeated their attack. Again, it was directed at the boats ahead. Three boats, brightly lit by parachute flares, concentrated their defensive fire and kept the planes at bay. A magnificent fireworks display erupted, consuming boats and bombers. Then, the English suddenly withdrew. Detections indicated that they were circling our tenacious parade and regrouping for a new attack. 1.45 am. Attack on the boat astern, the last in the column. It was the first target of the new enemy tactic. Intending to roll out the carpet of bombs from astern, a four-engine Liberator came shooting from starboard and dove onto the bow of U-256, Brauer's boat. His men opened fire, but the plane flew low over the boat and into the blind spot of the anti-aircraft guns. That was our chance. Weapons free, I shouted. Five barrels, all we had available, hurled their deadly load against the Liberator. 
In passing, it dropped four death charges in front of the bow of U-256. Four water columns shot skyward. But the well-directed fire from our 3.7cm automatic hit the Liberator broadside. It exploded in the air and plunged into the sea. U-256, battered and crippled, lay stopped in our wake. It slowly fell out of line. That was the last we saw of the boat. With a bitter taste in my mouth, I knew we were the next target of a new attack. I ordered new ammunition to the bridge, I gritted my teeth, I could not falter now. Take a deep breath and keep calm. 2.20 am. Detections from starboard. I assumed several aircraft were approaching simultaneously. Suddenly, a Sunderland was visible starboard ahead. Aircraft, starboard 40 degrees, weapons free. Short bursts of fire raced from our twin mounts toward the attacking aircraft. It skillfully flew forward to the right. Our defensive fire was very ineffective and four water bombs fell in front of our bow. At the same moment, a Liberator attacked from starboard a beam in low flight. It fired from all onboard cannons. In a fraction of a second, four deafening detonations rang midship beneath the boat. Four massive volcanoes threw the boat out of the water. Then U-415 fell back into the sea and the collapsing geysers drenched the bridge with tons of water and sent cascades through the tower hatch into the boat. Both diesels stopped. U-415 veered out of line with a starboard rudder jammed in a large arc. It rapidly lost speed and this was the end. Nearby, a marker buoy floated to starboard, its telltale light illuminated our dying boat. U-415 completely crippled, then lay still. Fuel leaked from a ruptured external tank, wounded prey that could easily be finished off. It is invasion time. D-Day is happening and our friend is in the middle of it. The good news is that the ramming order has been rescinded, but the new order is even worse. They are supposed to disrupt shipping on the southwest coast of England without air cover or snorkels, all the while the biggest amphibious assault in the history of mankind is taking place next door. As you might expect, it's not going well. Eight boats went out to do this and you have heard what happened to U-415, but we'll talk about it later. Of the other seven boats, here's what happened. Three were damaged and had to return to base. Three were sunk with the loss of all hands, and one boat had its captain wounded, so they too had to return to base. What a disaster. Well, at least Herbert survived, but what will happen to U-415 in the end? We will find out in the next episode, and I will see you then. Cheers, bye bye.